Hi guys, George with Troglodyne here again. Uh, another thing that comes up a lot when you're doing interviewing or talking to people about getting a contract uh, is sort of the, well, what do you do to keep yourself sharp, to keep yourself uh, up with latest trends, to improve your productivity, all that kind of jazz. Well, for me, there's sort of three big things uh, and they're all something that you can just keep working on and, and finding new ways to uh, improve. And the first category is basically meta heuristics, okay, which is the study itself of how do we come up with heuristics in the first place? And uh, in the advanced level, how do we automate finding those? Uh, that to me is one of the most interesting fields of AI research and something I'm very slowly, albeit, uh, starting to research into and learn a lot about. But the nice part is the methodology used to actually engage in meta heuristics, you can apply today right now to what you're actually doing so that you can get your existing heuristics for, well, what generally works with regard to this workflow, what, what doesn't. You use the same sort of annealing technique that uh, they use to uh, find out what heuristics work, what don't. Um, you can use essentially things like mimetic algorithms, uh, which are basically, you know, best encapsulated in practical, you know, real life as uh, good advice is what worked for me, bad advice is everything else, you know. So there's there's lots of techniques like that. And as I study meta heuristics more, I think we're going to get a lot more into it. And uh, hopefully things will work out uh, with regard to finding some new means for me to get more productive. Uh, but other than that, the two most effective things that I've found is crushing basically everything, getting in the way of working, uh, making sure that, you know, social loafing or procrastination or just context switching happens a lot, loss, lot less so you can get into flow state uh, where basically you're in the zone, as they call it, and everything just snaps into place because you have good focus. And the things that I found really hurt uh, my flow state, uh, aside from other people butting in, is going to be things like I have to move my hand to my mouse from my keyboard, or I have to uh, do an expensive pain switch, like uh, if I'm jumping from a virtual desktop to another virtual desktop, uh, or for example, uh, some other things that would be like bad syntax highlighting or inability to jump to an end of a line or inability to jump to the end of a block, uh, those sorts of things that you need to actually know where you are in a program, easily navigate it. Those are uh, very important for keeping your immersion in. Uh, and I always like to do like full screened everything rather than alt tabbing between a lot of different stuff. And I've found the probably best solution for this in actual practice. Hold on, excuse me. Okay. Uh, the actual best solution for me works on Linux and it's going to be uh, Vim, Tmux, and uh, like a drop down terminal so that I can have a browser back behind it. If I could have browsers in Tmux, I'd do it, but I don't. So uh, I use like a drop down terminal like Quake or Yaquake, or there's another one. I think it's called Tilda or, and th there's several others, but uh, the point is that uh, on OS X, I think it's called uh, iTerm, but yeah, it's all basically the same song and dance with regard to uh, it minimizes the costs of transitions in that I don't necessarily need a virtual desktop switch so that I don't see lots of movement on the screen. All I see is a terminal, and a lot of times my terminal is actually semi-transparent so I can see what I'm working on behind it uh, and even use a hotkey to just refresh the page and not even uh, move the terminal out from, from view. So that's actually pretty, pretty handy stuff. And then if I'm on Windows, on the other hand, there's not really any good terminal emulators, but VS Code is actually really good and its terminal works really good. So uh, what I end up doing there is I use virtual desktops uh, to deal with the fact that I can't actually uh, change my, uh, uh, do like a summonable terminal as well as I want to. You can with, uh, I believe it's alt tilde or something like that, or control tilde, one of those. Uh, and so that summons and gets rid of the debug console. And that really helps a lot. Uh, 
but the big thing that's preventing that makes it to where I have to jump between a bunch of different workspaces is that VS Code itself is not tabbed, so I can't have like uh, this one folder here in this one tab, this next folder here in another tab, yada yada yada, so that that way I could treat it like a Tmux pane and just uh, uh, Control B in, Control B P, all that kind of stuff to to page in in between back and forth from it, and so. I will say that Linux pretty much has everything I need. Um, and Windows has pretty much everything I need, but OS X, it acts a lot like Linux, but it makes sure that it gets in the way of itself so much that I just hate using it. And that's because of three different things. It's basically, it has different keyboard shortcuts and you can never reliably configure them. Uh, the window decorations and stuff are in non-standard locations and the virtual desktops are no longer in a consistent ordering between sessions uh, ever since 10.6. They've got this thing called Spaces, which is more like uh, just keeping track of full screen apps. And that's just not useful uh, from a point of view of virtual desktops. You need something where you uh, have key bindings where you can easily page between all of them, preferably where you can go by number one through 10 uh, to whichever virtual desktop you need. And uh, then aside from those sorts of like ergonomic uh, don't interrupt me and get me out of flow state things, it's going to be little things like uh, setting up uh, whenever I'm not required to be in a meeting, uh, stuff uh, called focus time. That's actually an acronym, but, you know, figure it out for yourself. Uh, the idea is that you want it to block off time for you to do this where all other notifications go away, they're turned off. And that's one thing I like about Windows OS X and Linux now, they almost all have a framework for turning notifications off uh, at particular hours. It's the same with phones, stuff like that. So uh, that helps you out a whole lot uh, with regard to keeping other people out of your business while you're doing that, which sort of comes to a lot of this other stuff where you're gonna nevertheless get interrupted no matter what. And so the way that I try to get those out of the way without causing some emotional fit, essentially, is of great concern. And it's because, and this is sort of in a related video I'll do at some point, it's essentially a lot of people, if you don't give them a little bit of validation with regard to the interaction, uh, they're going to either be frightened or they're going to... Uh, feel slighted or the point is they're going to then throw a fit and you're going to have to deal with it when what you need to do is figure out some way to validate them as fast as possible so that they just get out of your hair because uh, validation seeking behavior is almost never like practical it's not like uh, oh i need to fix x or y or z it's more like what do you think about x or y or z and my response is quite frankly, most of the time, I don't think about it. I'm too busy to think about it. Uh, go find somebody else to ask an opinion about, or better yet, don't. Uh, just do, and uh, we'll find out how it goes later, right? But you can't really avoid it these days. Um, the old way that engineers used to be used to communicating was always sort of uh, information primary, emotion secondary, if at all, right? And a lot of times this sort of like scares people who are, are very emotional and, and seeking validation with regard to the communication they do. Uh, they are trying to communicate emotion rather than communicate information, right? And so that is a very different sort of thing. And when you hear what people are, are trying to tell you, you have to then sort of walk it back to, well, what is their actual problem? And then when you find out what their actual problem is, you can either say, yeah, gee, that sucks, you know, uh, uh, good luck with that, you know, and, and just say something that tries to validate them. Or you can actually fix the problem, you know. Uh, that, that's sort of related to the old concept of the XY problem, which is, you know, customers, they do this as well, where they're like, hey, I want you to do X because I think it'll solve Y, but it won't, right? Because it's, you know, customer doesn't know what he's doing. And 
you just basically sort of have to turn off the part of you and the engineer in you that is looking for information that's actionable, right? Uh, it's the best video on this is called It's Not About the Nail, where it's basically uh, a girl has a nail in her head and she's like, I, I just feel this pressure on my head, this horrible headache. And the dude's like, well, you know, you do have a nail in your head, right? And the girl just keeps getting more and more upset because he's not validating and acknowledging her pain rather than trying to solve it and being like, well, we could just make it go away because that is to not validate them. And why did they get the nail in their head in the first damn place? Because that's what's really going on is they're emotionally invested in why they got the pain, right? Uh, and that's sort of what they're working through is, is divesting themselves emotionally of what's causing them pain. And you can do that. You can accelerate the process via helping induce cognitive dissonance in them, but this is a fraught process. And especially in the workplace, that's really sort of not your role. And you need to instead just find some way to get them off, off your back and, and go let them do whatever they're doing somewhere else so that you can get back to work, you know? And a lot of times they'll demand some validation from you, in which case, you know, if you actually provide it to them, you're just encouraging this behavior and which I regard, especially from a point of view of my productivity, this is behavior I don't want to reward because they're just going to come back and do it again. And they're going to keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this When What I want them to do instead is like find value in other ways or other people uh, and understand that my relationship with them is not here to provide them validation. I'm here to accomplish things and that's all, you know? So if I go ahead and validate them, then they're going to, it's essentially they're training me. It's a Skinner box either way. Either you train them or they train you. And I want to train them to stop bothering me unless it's important and has to do with something at work. So that's essentially... You're going to have to balance it in that, uh, yes, there will be times when you have to validate them, but you also have to make it clear on some level that, you know, uh, what you're giving them is like Esat's food. It's not real. It's not real validation and they know it. And it's, it's the, the interaction has to be vaguely unsatisfying so that they decide they need to go and find some place else to feed for this emotional nourishment that they're looking for. And so uh, the reason I, I'm pretty uh, vehement on this subject is because when you start to build emotional investment and you start to uh, get these sorts of validation-seeking behaviors between employees, that crowds out you investing in the customer. And that's the most important thing with regard to any kind of uh, organization continuing and being profitable is that you can't sympathize with your coworkers and your management more than you sympathize with the customer and their needs and their wants. You should be validating the customer's decisions because they're buying your stuff. They should think it's valid. You know, those are the people that you do want to validate. Those are the people that you do want to do these things. Uh, you know, and so you have to restrict when you're dealing with your coworkers uh, the sort of validation you give to when it's genuinely things that are good, which is reinforcing that, you know, sort of customer focus. You don't want to encourage them for playing house. What you want to do is encourage anything that they're doing that's going to help the customer rather than uh, help them feel good about, you know, I'm in an organization and I'm part of a team, you know. That's not what you need to do. Uh, you need to make sure that they all pull towards the customer and that's how your team has to be. And, and that's, I mean, it's to some level Machiavellian type of manipulation, but you have to plan this out to some degree. You have to make an effort to be customer focused. This is actually hard to do because the customer is not there with you all the time. And it's so tempting for you to uh, want this like IV drip of validation from the people in your life rather than get this super way more worthwhile validation from customers who say, man, I love you and are willing to pay you gobs of money uh, for the uh, uh, you know privilege. So that's 
the biggest thing I think towards productivity on teams and my own uh, increasing ability to deliver on software projects is uh, I learned this when I was doing QA that basically if you want projects to succeed, it's not enough to test and make the product itself better. The people making it have to become better. Okay. And people don't often want to do that willingly. They don't uh, want to go to that effort. They will be stuck in their old ways, things like that. And the only way that you can actually get all of those things starting to move in the positive direction is through these reinforcement techniques of uh, you know, rewarding good behavior that is focused towards serving the customer and all that and punishing or simply not rewarding custom behavior that is not that, right? So I think the biggest problem in that regard these days is uh, these like chat servers and stuff like that, which uh, sort of encourage this like high school water cooler sort of atmosphere at uh, firms. And that's exactly what I was talking about here, where uh, you can only communicate so much in a day before you just you get tired out of it. I can You can already tell my voice is starting to die here, right? So when it comes to chat, it's sort of the same thing, even with your fingers. You know, you, you have only so much cognitive load you can take in a day. And the more you're spending it, you know, uh, seeking validation and talking to your fellow workers, that's less time you can do that and think about the customer. So you want to make sure you're going to need to talk to your coworkers and all that stuff more than anybody else. Yes, but you need to temper that with an understanding that it always is secondary to those sorts of things. All right, that's all I got for now. I will be back with another video soon, guys.